Good morning. I'm so glad to see everyone here. It's going to be a darling of a day. Testing, testing, do, re, mi, testing, there we go, cool. Enjoy this cool day today, because I got notified yesterday there's a chance that to, this week it will be what? 107 degrees. Now we have two choices. Look for the largest puddle you can find, or stay in your house. Somebody thought maybe you just drive around your car with the air conditioner on. That might work. Of course, your car is going to get kind of hot, so it's going to be warm. Anyway, it's delightful to be here today. I guess the temperature is supposed to be around 89, 90, so that's still bearable. So thank you so much for coming. Welcome. Only 105. In fact, so there's a cool wind over there, 105. Wow. I can't remember the last time it was triple digits in Oregon. It's been a while. It's been a while. Well, let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come in your presence and have fellowship one with another as we look into your scriptures and you teach us, Heavenly Father, what we need to learn, how we can make our relationship with you much closer heavenly father so we begin to understand your heart and your mind and your love for us thank you so much for that love and the set apart day that you've given us so we can put the things of the world aside and focus upon you and upon your people in yahushua hamashiach's name i pray amen let's all stand and we're going to read Yeshua, the hope of Israel, and then we're going to do the Torah blessing, and I'll read the Torah portion. Let's read this together. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahweh your Elohim. You do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested in the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. Amen. Now for the Torah blessing before the reading. Excellent. And don't forget, there's a part that says all. That's all, right? Baraku et Yahweh hamavarak. Baruch Yahweh Hamavarak Leolam Vayed. Baruch Yahweh Hamavarak Leolam Vayed. Baruch Ata Yahweh Elohenu Melech Ha'alam Ashar Bakar Banu Miko Ha'amin Venatan Lanu Et Torah To. Baruch Ata Yahweh Baruch Shemo No Tain Ha Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from among all peoples and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh, bless his name, giver of the Torah. I'm going to be reading from Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 1. Are you ready? These are the words that Moshe spoke to all Israel across Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arabah opposite Suf, between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hezroth, and Dizahab. It's an 11 days journey from Horeb by way of Mount Zir to Kadesh Barnea. Now Moshe spoke to Israel according to all Yahweh had commanded him for them in the 40th year in the 11th month on the first day of the month after he had struck down Sion king of the Amorites who lived in Heshbon and Og king of the Bashan who lived in Ashtaroth and Andre. Across the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moshe began to explain his Torah, saying, Yahweh, our Elohim, spoke to us at Horeb, saying, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn, journey on, and enter the hill country of the Amorites and all their neighbors in the Arabah, the hill country, the lowland, the Negev, and by the seashore, the land of Canaanites and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the Euphrates. See? I have set the land before you. Enter and possess the land that Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their descendants after them. 
I spoke to you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear the burden of you by myself. Yahweh, your Elohim, has multiplied you, and here you are today, like the stars of the heavens in the number. May Yahweh Elohim of your fathers increase you a thousand times as many as you are, and may he bless you just as he has promised you. How can I bear your load and burden and bickering by myself? Choose for yourselves wise and discerning men, well known to your tribes, and, and I will appoint them as your heads. You answered me and said, the thing you have said to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, men who were wise and well-known, and appointed them as heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officials for your tribes. I commanded your, you judges at the time, saying, hear cases between your brothers and judge fairly between a man and his brother or the outsider with them. You must not show partiality in judgment. You must hear the small and the great alike. Fear no man, for the judgment is Elohim's. The case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me, and I will hear it. I commanded you at, the very, at that time everything you should do. Then we journeyed from Horeb and went through all that great and terrible wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as Yahweh our Elohim commanded us. Then we came to Kadesh Barnea, and I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which Yahweh our Elohim is giving to us. See, Yahweh your Elohim has set the land before you. Go up, take possession, as Yahweh Elohim of your fathers has promised you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Then all of you came near to me and said, let's send men ahead of us to explore, explore the land for us and bring back us word about the way we should go up and the cities we will enter. The idea seemed good to me. So I took 12 men from among you, one man from each tribe. They turned and went up into the hill country, and they came to the Wadi Eshkol and spied it out. They took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us. They also brought us back to word us and said, Good is a land that Yahweh or Elohim is giving to us. Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of Yahweh or Elohim. In your tent you grumbled and said, Because Yahweh hates us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going? Our brothers have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people are greater and taller than we are. The cities are great and fortified up to the heavens. Besides, we have even seen the children of Anakim there. Then I said to you, Don't tremble or be afraid. Yahweh, your Elohim, who goes before you, he himself will fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your own eyes. And in the wilderness, where you saw how Yahweh, your Elohim, carried you as a man carries his son, everywhere you went until you came to this place. Yet, for all of this, you did not trust in Yahweh, your Elohim, the one who goes before you on the way to scout out a place for you to camp and to show you the way you should go in fire by night and in cloud by day. When Yahweh heard of the tone of your words, he was angry and swore an oath, saying, Not one of these men of this evil generation will see the good land that I swore to give your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Yephunneh. He will see it. Yet to him and his children I will give the land that he has walked on, because he has followed Yahweh wholeheartedly. Yahweh was even angry with me on your account, saying, You will not enter there either. Joshua, son of Nun, who stands before you, will enter there. Encourage him, for he will enable Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones, whom you said would become plunder, and your children who today have no knowledge of good or evil, they will enter there. To them I will give it, and they will possess it. But as for you, turn around and journey into the wilderness by the way of the Sea of Reeds. Then you answered and said to me, We have sinned against Yahweh. We will go up and fight just as Yahweh our Elohim commanded us. So each of you strapped on his weapons of war, figuring it was easy to go up to the hill country. But Yahweh said to me, tell them, do not go up and fight, for I am not with you, and you will be defeated by your enemies. So I told you, but you would not listen. You rebelled against the command of Yahweh and presumptuously went up into the hill country. The Amorites who lived in that hill country came out against you, and they chased you as bees do and scattered you from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before Yahweh, but Yahweh did not listen to your voice or pay attention to you. So you stayed in Kaddish many days, like the days you had spent before.
blessings after reading the Torah. Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu melech ha'alam asher natah lanu Torah amet yekeye olam be natah betekenu Baruch atah Yahweh Baruch shemo no tain ha Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh. Bless his name, giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Shabbat Shalom. Dale is uh, taking a day off today from uh, teaching, facilitating, I should say, the Torah portion. And I have the honor of being asked to do that today. Is that going to be all right? We're going to. Well, okay. <laughs> Well, it's a great honor for me to be able to facilitate our conversation today. And the Heavenly Father has laid a few things on my heart that I want to share from his word. And uh, I, I know that all of us who come at this hour, we are looking in our lives for the things in his word that we can put into play, right? We want to know the explicit things that he says, do it this way instead of this way. And then the other thing that we're looking for is the, um, the concepts the, the, just the, the general things that please him, right? So that we can incorporate those things into our lives. So I think our portion today has kind of a mixture of those, of those two elements. So let's, do you think that's me? I can always switch if I need to, to something different. Hey, hey, it works, good. All right, so let's start with an overview. So today is an exciting day because it's not just a Torah, another Torah portion. It's the first portion of a new book. We have reached the fifth book, uh, Devarim. And in English, Deuteronomy, which in English, it's second law, which comes from chapter 17, verse 18. And that was because basically in Deuteronomy, Moses is giving a retelling of the, of the statutes and the precepts and the commands that, he's, that the Heavenly Father had already laid and put forward. Uh, it does mean, it means words in Hebrew because that's how it begins. And these are the words, verse 1-1, one, one, these are the words that Moshe spoke to all of Israel, right? There's a theme in the book, and that theme, overarching theme, is remembrance. Not only does... Moshe talk to them about things that have happened in their history, in other words, giving them a history lesson. But he's also saying over and over in the book, and we'll find this all the way till the end, he says to them, remember and never forget. Reminds me of what Dale said last week when the words were avenge, avenge. In the, we couldn't see it in the English, but in the Hebrew it was avenge, avenge. And there was a, that when there's a duplicity like that, there's a meaning to that. And this remember, and never forget is the same kind of an emphasis when we see something twice. Um, so in the whole book, again, I'm not just talking about our portion today, but I'm talking about the whole book. Moshe b basically starts with a big history lesson. Then in the second phase, his, his second sermon, if you will, he goes into the uh, main elements of the covenant that the children have entered into with the Heavenly Father. And then the third one is the blessings and the, cur the, blessings and the cursings. Um, and then, of course, at the end of the, at the end of the portion, he goes up Mount Pisgah and then and dies. So, it's interesting when Yeshua was asked what the greatest commandment is, he quoted from Deuteronomy. All right, and there's one group of scholars they have counted 100 quotations or allusions to Deuteronomy in the New Testament. So it's heavily quoted. Also, Isaiah and the Book of Psalms are the other two books that are the most heavily quoted in the New Testament. So that is um, just a little bit of an overview of the book itself. And then I just wanted to show you this slide real quickly. This was prepared by a couple uh, from Australia. And what they did was they took the biblical record 
and they took historical records, and they took archaeological records, and they took satellite imagery of, from the present day so that they could see the topography of the land. And from that, they have pieced together this map, which they believe shows the journeyings of the children of Israel. And so what's interesting is, of course, leg one is the pink one. Oh, I pushed the wrong button. There we go. So the pink one, they were down here, started up down at the bottom, and then they were just supposed to go up to here, and this is where, as Dale calls it, Spygate happened, right? And then they wouldn't, they wouldn't go in. They made, a, they made another choice. So um, legs two and legs three, the red and the blue, those were basically their quote-unquote killing time. Um, legs where they were journeying various places in the land, all the different wilderness areas. And then once the unbelieving generation died off, that's when then the green leg took place. And that's when they could then make their journey back to the area where the Heavenly Father wanted them to cross over and go into the, into the land. Okay? So basically that's where, that's, that's where we are. Okay? So Deuteronomy occurs in the 40th year from the exodus from Egypt. And this is a very significant year in the people's history because in the first month of that year, Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Moshe and Aharon, she dies. Then in the fifth month, Aharon dies. And then we know, they don't know it yet, but we know that Moshe died in the 12th month. All right, and now what we're, the point that we are, as we uh, Dale read our portion today, is the first day of the 11th month. So they're thinking that the book of Deuteronomy basically took about a month, and then Moshe um, went up the mountain and, and died. So it's interesting to me, this is one of the things the Father laid on my heart. In verses chapter 1, verses 9 through 15, one of the first things that Moshe talks about in this remembrance is their leadership structure and how it was set up. Now you remember back in the day, it was all Moshe. There were no additional leaders. Um, there were no designated leaders and it was too much for him. The people were wearing out. They were standing in line to have their case adjudicated and Moshe was also being worn out. So his father-in-law said, hey, I have, a, I have a suggestion. And so he took it and set up leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties and leaders of 10. I like to think of it as leadership by love, like a big brother. Okay, so a family of 10 families have somebody that's responsible to know what's going on in their lives and to look out for them and maybe if they have a question to answer it or maybe to carry a question forward to the next level of leadership, that kind of thing. And it's interesting because as I was preparing for this Torah portion, in my psalm, in my reading of the Psalms, I came to Psalm 9510. And it says, for 40 years, I, Yahweh, was grieved with that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. They go astray in their hearts. Where does going astray start? It starts on the inside. Before some lady runs off with the, with the mailman, it started in her heart, right? So this is what really touched me about this concept of the leaders of these small groups of people, leaders of 10 and then leaders of 50, is that when we have somebody that cares about what happens in our lives, who is over us, who is watching, um, the New Testament even says caring for our souls, somebody who cares, and we let them into our hearts, we let them behind the curtain, so to speak, in our hearts, it is much it, there's accountability there. It's, e it's easy for them to see how we're doing. You know, you can talk to somebody for just a few minutes and you can find out, are they full of faith or are they full of worry? Or are they full, you know, what are they full of right now at this, at this moment in their life? And therefore, what do they need? What do they need from me as a leader? What do they need from somebody that's giving accountability with them? So in actually in Hebrews 3.12, the writer of Hebrews calls it an evil heart 
of unbelief. When we have a heart that's not believing, it's actually something that's looked on as evil. So that's not something we want. We're not here to learn that side of things, right? We're here to learn what the Heavenly Father wants. So the more we can let people into our hearts, and I know that's hard for some people. It's hard for certain personalities to let people know. It's hard for those of us who suffer from pride right? Because we don't want people to know, always know exactly where we are. But the more we do that, the more accountability we have, the more we are going to be pleasing him and not be um, getting, uh, getting onto the wrong side of, of something. One more point on leadership that I think is interesting for us to pull from here is succession planning. You noticed um, in chapter one that Dale read is that the Heavenly Father told Moshe, he says, We're, um, Yahushua, Joshua, is going to be the next leader. Your, your, your time is over. It's going to be the next leader. You, Moshe, you need to strengthen Joshua. And then in verse, uh, excuse me, in, in chapter 3, he says, you need to strengthen Joshua and make him brave. Okay? So there was succession planning. All right? So that's something also I think the New Covenant uh, assemblies should take into, into consideration. When one person is phasing out, is just to do our best to find a replacement and bring them up to speed and, and so that it's a smooth transition for the people, right? And then, if anybody's taking notes, go ahead and just write down Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews 13, 17. That's a good one for us to meditate on privately because at the end of the day, we're all followers of somebody, right? We're all following somebody, and that's a wonderful scripture for us to incorporate. It's good for followers to read that, okay? So, let's move on to the next one. Now, I purposefully left a word off when I was... Um, on the previous slide, the leaders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, but there was one more word and I left it off on purpose until now, and that was officers. That's Strong's number 7860, Shoter, Ashin, Atav, and Arash, and it means to be an official superintendent or a magistrate, all right? Well, magistrates have to do with ju the judiciary, right? So this was their element of, of judging. I'm sure that the leaders, the, the, the other leaders that we were just talking about had a role in this, and there may have been cases where they were one in the same person. I think that's a little fuzzy, but uh, the point is that there was somebody that people could go to if they had a dispute of some type, if they had something that they needed, that they needed help with. So the judges were to rule matters between people at lower levels and hard cases were supposed to go up to Moshe. Now anyone who's read the Torah through has a good sense that caring for vulnerable people and taking good care of one another and also having there be justice, having there be um, right ruling between two people where there was some sort of a of dispute. That's very close to the Father's heart. That is the Father's heart, caring for people. He sends his reign on the just and the unjust, right? He is into caring for people. So the Torah is full of that, and that's something that is very clear to see as we go through um, many different elements of it. So it's interesting, our Hof Torah this week, I don't know, how many of you read the Hof Torah at, at home? We don't read it here in the assembly. Excellent, good. I encourage the rest of you to do that. Every once in a while, it's a head scratcher of why they connected a certain Hof Torah portion with the Torah, but most of the time, there's a clear connection, as there is today. So if you would turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 1. And we're going to read, uh, just do a little reading from 17 to 27. Learn to do good. Seek right ruling. Reprove the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says Yahweh. Those your, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you submit and obey, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. Now let's um, go down a little bit further uh, to 23. Your rulers are stubborn and companions of thieves. 
Everyone loves bribes and runs after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow reach them. Therefore, Master Yahweh declares, excuse me, the Master declares, Yahweh of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, Ah, I shall be avenged of my adversaries, and I shall be avenged of my enemies. And I shall turn my hand against you, and shall refine your dross as with lye, and shall remove your alloy. And I shall give back your judges. Now, that, that's the bad news. Obviously, the people were not doing their jobs. The people people weren't doing their jobs in caring for one another. So the fatherless and the widow had to go to the judges. But guess what they found when they reached the judges? Bribery, partiality, and that was not good, all right? And so Yahweh is giving his, his judgment upon them. But then please look at verse 26. So this is still Isaiah 1, 26. I shall give back your judges as at the first. He's talking about the system that Moshe set up. And your counselors as at the beginning. And after this, you shall be called a city of righteousness, a steadfast city. Talking about Jerusalem. So is Jerusalem called that today? No, not yet, but one day they will be called that. And the question we, have for, we need to have for ourselves is, how are we doing caring for the fatherless and the widows? How are we doing? So as we go from Torah portion to Torah portion, this is one of those things that we just need to take to our heart. It is, it's very exciting to me. I, I know people want to keep it a secret, but there are wonderful things that are happening and people ministering from one person to another and people caring for people in our congregation, uh, widows and more, right? So there's wonderful stories that are going on, but let's, let's not just rest on those laurels. Let's continue to remain open to the leading of the, of the Father so that we can use our resources in ways that please Him, treating one another in ways that we would like to be treated, amen? And we can rejoice that Moshe's model will one day be reestablished. So I want to just talk real quickly about the importance of trust. Um, obviously, at Spygate, they did not trust what he said. He said to go up, and they, and they didn't do it. We want to say to them, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? But actually, chapter 1, back in Devarim, chapter 1, verse 22, tells us what they were thinking, okay? And it says... All of you came near to me, this is Moshe, and they said, let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us of the way by which we should go up. Well, that's very interesting because I had it on good authority. There was a cloud by day and a fire by night that was leading them where they should go. And now they want to send men to decide. So look at verse 133. Who is going, Yahweh your Elohim is going before you in the way to seek out a place for you to pitch your tents and to show you the way that you should go in a fire by night and a cloud by day. So they, for some reason, that just wasn't enough for them, right? And I just pray that we would remain little children before him and that we would always be trusting in him and uh, wanting to do it his way, right? I mean, we've all learned the hard lesson that our way is not the good way, right? And his way is, his way is the good way. So we want to be those little children. So just for, we just have a couple more minutes. Let's stay on this topic just a little bit more. And let's go to verses, uh, still in chapter 1, but 26 and 27. You would not go up. You rebelled against the mouth of Yahweh your Elohim and grumbled in your tents and said, because Yahweh was hating us, he has brought us out of the land of Mitzrayim to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Look at how closely the word rebelled is to grumbled. And then let's look, jump down to 43. So I spoke to you, but you would not listen and rebelled against the mouth of Yahweh and acted proudly and went up into the mountain. Look at how closely rebelled and acted proudly are together. And when I read that, that really jumped out at me. I had to say to myself, hmm, when I grumble, do I really think of that as rebelling against the Heavenly Father? And I'm thinking, no. I I don't think of that. I think, oh, I was human, or oh, I was weak, or oh, I was tired, or oh, I was this, or oh, I was that. But we have a little evidence here that he sees it differently, right? Because he wants to be believed, right? Without faith, is it, it is impossible to please him, right? 
So um, am I a grumbling free zone yet? No. Are we a grumbling free zone yet? Not yet. Not yet. I like the way Gabriel answered that because there's hope, all right, if we will remain um, with him. Yah help us. So in closing, I just want to, you can read this this afternoon. I want you to look at the correlation between um, what they did here when they, wouldn't, when they wouldn't go in. What did he say? He said, then we got to wait for this generation, this unbelieving generation to die off, all right? And how long? Scripture in chapter 2, verse 14 tells us that they languished in the wilderness for 38 years. And then how long was the man lying as an invalid at the pool of Bethesda or Bethesda? 38 years, all right? And what did Yeshua say to that man? He said, rise up and walk. And if you read the rest of this Torah portion, if you haven't already, you probably were impressed with how many times Moshe told the people, rise up, rise up. So read those and just see that they were immobile for 38 years. They were not fulfilling the will of Yah. That's a sad thing. But the beauty of it is they were healed, they went in, the time was up, and they were able to go into the land. It wasn't always perfect, but at least they, they made it that far, right? And in the same way, the man was completely healed at, when Yeshua healed him. And it's interesting to me what he said to the man after he healed him. He said, go, as he said very often, he said, go and sin no more, right? He said, in, in case something worse happens to you or to avoid something worse happening to you. So rise up, believe and walk, do the Torah, rise up and walk, go and sin no more. In other words, get back to the Torah, get back to the Father's commands, get back to his heart and then you will be on the right path. Amen? Amen? All right. Well, time is up. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Torah portion today. Thank you for the concept of letting people into our lives and having accountability with you. Thank you for principles of justice and right ruling. I just pray that we would absorb those things into our daily lives, Father, and into this congregation to the fullest extent that you would desire. I just pray that we would be the generation that is trusting you, that is hearing your voice, that is obeying like little children, and that we would be able to participate with you in rooting out any pride or grumbling that we're allowing in our very lives. And thank you for our Savior, Yahushua, who has died for us and whose, sin, whose blood covers our sins. We thank you for the preciousness of the gift that he is to us and that, um, that we are to one another as we live in him. We pray it in his name for your glory, O Yahweh. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody.